My dear Lilibet, it is with mixed feelings that I sit and write you this missive 55 years after you visited Sierra Leone that we all now call Mama Saloon. I can still feel your exuberance from the day you arrived on 25th November 1961 until you departed on 1st December the very 1961, not realizing that your goodbye was like forever. Even though you were gone, I never felt empty since you left me with our elder Milton for Minde. After Milton came his small brother Albert. But Albert caused the soldier men to come, so they came. First, Lansana, the brigadier from Minde. Then the Banawan called Joxin from Kriu, followed by Bangura, the other brigadier from Timne, who wasted no time handing over to Shaki from Limba. Shaki too, when taking his exit, passed the baton to Momo, the first major general, also from Limba. One after the other, they departed to the land of the forefathers. But it was Momo who allowed those other guys to enter. First that one named Sebana from Temini, who like your grand old Duke of York had over 10,000 men. He marched them right from the top of the Mende Kambui, through the Wosum of the Temini, across the Warawara of the Limba and marched them down to town. Yet, Sebana was unable to reach Momo and get the baton. Then entered those young soldiers. First, the village grammar school crew boy named Valentine, followed by the Mende, though not an elder, yet called Mada. After young Mada came in Tijan. Do you remember Tijan? That tall, gallant, learned barrister brother man from Madingo? Tijan got with his left hand. Momo before him wrote with his left hand, so does Anestu, who has come after Tijan. Well, Tijan came in twice, interrupted by Paul, then bouncing back again. Lilibet, you know what? As I was writing this missive, I wrote to him. I mean, Anestu, demanding a few short answers about you. Prompt as he always is, he called and spoke to me in his usual calm but authoritative voice. Afino. Yes, Ernesto. I was only a boy when Auntie Lilibet last visited in 1961. As a pupil in my Timini village primary school upline, I can only remember taking part in a match pass followed by a feasting of jollof rice and mineral soft drinks. I also remember that I and each school boy and girl received one specially designed independence cup, one plate, one small saloon flag, one British Union Jack, and a large sized photograph of the royal family. The next day, Ernesto scribbled the following to me. Dear Afino, for my humble history lessons at my upline Mabruka Boys Secondary School, I can remember that Auntie Lilibet was born on 21st April 1926 in London, England. Her name at birth was Elizabeth Alexander Mary Windsor, best known worldwide as Queen of Great Britain. According to Ernesto's letter, Auntie Lilibet became Queen of United Kingdom in February 1952 after the death of her father, King George VI. She was only 26 then. She was formally crowned the following year on 2nd June 1953. Ernesto's letter concluded that Auntie Lilibet's husband, Prince Philip, came from the royal family of the Greek people and was created Duke of Edinburgh just before their wedding on 20th November 1947. Ah, Lilibet. So you and Philip have been married for 69 good years, eh? My good gracious, with four children, Charles, born in 1948, Anne, 1950, Andrew, 1960, and Edward, 1964. Charles, my namesake, will be the next king after you. I knew that long ago, and everybody knows. Now, Lilibet, tell me, was it true that you did not want to become queen? Was it true that when you learned that you'd likely be the queen after your father, you prayed every night for a baby boy that would take your place? Ah, Lilibet, you make me laugh. You funny too much. <laughs> eh, Lilibet, in all these past 55 years, did you ever stop and think about how you made independence difficult for us? 
First, you demanded that we form a united front that should bargain with you and your guys to determine whether or not we were befitting the freedom we demanded. Remember? Then the independence talks at your London Lancaster house. Then the rumbling and the tumbling, the infighting, the rattling, the cat and mouse games, the unity, the split, the unity again, and the rehearsals. Yet, you did not make it to the independence ceremony on April 27, 1961. Rumors had it that you just had a new baby Andrew. Where is Andrew now? He must have become 55. Did Andrew celebrate his 55th birthday? Did he have reasons to celebrate? Because for us, Mama Salonians, we are divided. Some say we should celebrate and thank the Almighty for just his sparing masses. Others say we should not for lack of bread and butter. There are those, of course, who just don't care if we celebrate or not. But Libet, is it true that you were annoyed with Shaki? For refusing to sign the independence document because he did not agree with the defense arrangements between Sierra Leone and Britain? Shaki's behavior to me was just a show of gods. For one man to adhere so bravely to his belief, alone at home and away. Anyhow, Lilibet, your cousin, Duke of Kent, whom you sent to represent you, did so very well. He proclaimed Sierra Leone's independence at midnight on 26 27 April. On your behalf, the Duke handed over to Sir Milton in the House of Representatives the formal constitutional document affecting Sierra Leone's transition from a British colony to a sovereign state. Sir Milton Magai became the first Prime Minister and Sir Henry Lightfoot Boston from Creole, the first Sierra Leonean Governor General, replacing Sir Maurice Doman, the last British Governor. As this was happening, I remember John Aka, the first Director General of Sierra Leone Broadcasting Service, SLBS, who was running the live radio commentaries on the event that morning, as the people glued themselves to the home-based radio set known as Kungu Sabok. The Union Jack is being lowered, and the green, white, and blue flag of the world's newest nation raised. Sierra Leone has today become the 100th member of the United Nations. Heep, 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 hooray! Immediately, the nation rose to its feet, and for the first time, the band of the Royal Sierra Leone Military Forces poured out the newly composed national anthem to music composed by the very commentator himself, John Acker from Shabru, with words by Christopher Nelson File from Creole. Lilibet, I know that your cousin gave you the complete rundown of events as they happened. He must have shown you photos of himself attending a boat race by teams racing in wooden boats, him in white uniform inspecting a guard of honor mounted by soldiers, and him in a car waving to children and adults along a crowded road in the countryside. I can still hear the various music in my brain, and visualize the musical displays that dominated the airways from all directions. Music of independence, music of unity, freedom and justice, music from the trombone of the military to the trumpet of the police, the banjo of Haman, the mandolin of Kalenda, the accordion of Salia, the cries of Ali Ganda, the Shagure of Emi Kalon, the Gumbe of Pitana Lepet, the Balanji of Fode Luseni, the Shangba of Tamba Musa, the Kondi of Basi, the Keleng of Lansana, the Dunduba of Seduba, the Bloblo of the Bubu, the flute of Bras Simeon, the chant of Chris Durin and his Goka River boys, the piano of Giraldo Pino, the dynamics of Dr. Dynamite drums of Masoko. Local. From the Milo Jazz of Dr. Olo to the wailings of S.E. Rogers piercing the gramophone of Adenuga and Junetan. All amid the spectacles of the Jamama of Wanjama, the Gongoli of Zimi, the Mamakpara of Marampa, the Gbete, Gerefe and Nafali, the Bondo of Small Bo, the Soko Bana of Yoni Bana, the Bangbani of Bombali, Hunting of Wellington, Ogugu of Orogu, Okosha of Savage Choir, the Fairy of Kisi Ferry, from Lord Amasi to the Kakadebul, from the Rainbow and the Padul to the Tentemute of Rumankne, from the recreation grounds in the west to coronation in the south, Wosum in the north to cacao show fields in the east. Lilibet, S. E. Rogers, known as Roji. Do you remember Roji? That dark, hefty palm wine musician from Mindy? 
Everyone thought he was your lover because he sang about you in his hit song, My Lovely Elizabeth, where he sobs openly that Lilibet that he loved so well has been snatched from him. Lilibet, there is something I always wanted to ask you. Did Milton reveal to you why he chose April 27 as the date of independence? There were lots of rumors rolling in the air. Some say April 27 was chosen because it was the founding date of the Sirelum People's Party by Sam Milton, who was both leader of the SLPP and the independence movement. Others say it was the date that the chiefs in the rest of the country took up their cutlasses and chakabulas and joined by Bure from Timini Loko in the hot tax war that he declared to fight against further spread of your colonial domination. Others say it was a combination of the two. Sure, you must have heard about this famous no-nonsense anti-British hero called by Bure. If you have not, Check through your father's memoirs. It happened in his time. By the time you arrived in Freetown, on that warm November 25th, 1961, the nation was more than ready to receive and accommodate you. On your arrival to a 21-gun salute, we all watched the ship that you came by, called Britannia, sailing from Northern Atlantic Ocean into the Queen Elizabeth II Deepwater Key, named after you. On coming ashore, you were met by Prime Minister Sir Milton Magai. Then the 1st Battalion of the Royal Sierra Leone Regiment formed a guard of honor which you inspected with your husband. Then you both drove in a special Queen's motorcade through the streets as people waved and cheered. Lilibet, I always recall your action when those protected women came out in their grand buba, temule, madingu docket and lapa made from Thai, Dai, Gara, Batik and brilliant materials, complete with gorgeous matching hair ties. The Creole women also were in their specially designed long cabaslot and kutuku ashobis of many colors made from assorted print materials. Some with step-like laced petticoats named Simplicity. By the way, people overheard you saying to Philip, it's hot. Provincial men poured out in gowns made out of colorful country clothes from the southeast. The men of the north in their ronko gowns and shokoto made out of dark red country cloth, colony men in shirts, gabardine trousers, tuxedos, waistcoats and ties also came out discussing matters of independence. I understand that you sample as much of the variety of our dishes, the nation's favorite cassava and potato leaves, groundnut stew, a goosey palava okra sauce with fufu, sweet potato cocoa bear, funde, agidi and palm oil soup, beans akara, ginger cake and lots more. I heard that you also had ginger beer and jelly water, whilst Philip had a go at the god to man palm wine called Puyu or Mampama. I heard that the women of Waterloo sent you fried fish and cassava bread. Both women came with gari. Those of Hastings gave you mangoes. Both women sent you coconut oil. Palm kernel oil came from Pujeu. Oni came from Kailau and rough rice from Cambia. All as gifts to take home to your children, Charles and Anne. Just last week, when I mentioned your name to my mother, she beamed with joy and her face lit up. She said she still has cherished memories of your handshake with the Prime Minister Sam Milton Magai when you came out of your Britannia ship. She recalled your drive to the Governor General's residence at Fort Taunton, where Ernesto's office occupies today. She recalls your presence at the military parade of the 1st Battalion Royal Sierra Leone Regiment. The Children's Rally, the Citizens' Parade, the Mayor's presentation of a golden key to you at Victoria Park, your husband's visit to the construction site at Gumadam, the Sunday service you attended at St. George's Cathedral, the degrees you presented at the University College, the state banquet and garden party given by the Prime Minister at his official residence. By the way, Lilibet, do you remember the girl who presented you with that bouquet at the recreation grounds? Ask Philip, your husband, whether he still can recall that lady with those gold coins in her hair. Even though it was 55 years ago, my mother remembers. In Bo, the capital of the southern province, you visited the government hospital and the Bo school. You attended the state reception of chiefs, the national chiefs Doba. 
in the eastern province, you were present at the Kenema Agricultural Cacao Show and witnessed diamond digging in Kono. In the northern province, you visited the iron ore works at Magampa Mines in Putloko. So, without discrimination, you paid homage to all the regions, west, south, east and north. Even though it was 55 years ago, my mother remembers. However, some of the things that you left behind are still with us. The Poro and the Sukubana, the Bundu, the Gbangbani, the Wunde, the Hunting and the Freemasons are still mingling with us. Two things that you left that are no more are, one, the railway. I mean the train and the song that the children sang, Bo Train, Waterloo, are no more. But the remains of the Queen's Coach, the one especially designed for your visit in 1961, is being restored. I went to see it at the newly established Railway Museum, where the new Monuments and Relics Commission, set up by Ernesto, is keeping it safely. The other that you left behind, but is no more, is the double-decker bus. Lilibet, did you know that when the two-storied bus first arrived here in January 1955, it baffled the people, including the bus drivers, who went into hiding? My father told me that the governor, Sir Maurice Dorman, government officials and other invited passengers had all entered the bus and taken their seats for the maiden ride, but all the bus drivers had taken cover. The only one who not only did not hide, but jumped into the driving seat, started the double-decker bus, and drove his passengers from Kleintown to Congo Cross and back, was a fuller man named Abdullah Ba. Yes, a fuller man was the first to drive the double-decker bus when it first arrived in Sierra Leone in 1951. As for the other vehicles you left behind, Hillman, Prefect, Vanguard, Bedford, Maurice and Austin, they have all been replaced by those of the family of the Japan. The Land Rover keeps going and coming. The board houses will soon be gone. The Roman Catholic, the church missionary and Methodists are currently being bombarded from all directions by the new believers and crusaders who are busy changing the names you left behind from Isabella, Victoria, Christiana and Diana to blessing, flavor, miracle and God's will. Atasin Zokoni's PZ, United Africa Company, UAC, British Petroleum, BP, King's Wasters are gone and forgotten. My dear Lilibet, when on the 1st of December 1961 you should depart, it was difficult to come to the acceptance that the best of friends must part. I can remember the whole nation in their variety of ways bidding their farewell. Malawe, said the Mindy. Awayo, cried the Timini. Masankane, bellowed the Limba. And Tata went to the Creo. The only lamentation was Roji, your secret lover, whose voice was of pain and sorrow as he wailed over the rhythm of the electric guitar they said you bought him. Sweet Elizabeth, why did you go? Come back to your lovely Roji, your lucky boy Roji. Don't you listen to whatever they may say. Come back to your lovely Roji. But you did not budge. 1961 to 2016. From Milton to Albert. Albert to Lansana. Lansana to Joksin. Joksin to Bangura. Bangura to Shaki. Shaki to Momo. You did not come. From Momo to Valentine. Valentine to Mada. Mada to Tijan. Tijan to Paul. Paul to Tijan again. Tijan to Anesku. You did not come. Fifty years have passed. Ebola came alone and perished 10,000 souls, and you have not come back just to say hi or to find out what's up. Nevertheless, just save Lilibet, just save Ernesto. Before I put my pen down, before I terminate, I am yours sincerely, the namesake of your firstborn, Tali Afino, as Mama Salonians call me. <laughs> Yeah, man.